I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Terror you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. The UN Security Council prepares to vote on calls for a ceasefire in Gaza. We'll have the latest on the conflict and the likelihood of Israel scaling back its operation. Who's in the wrong? Baroness Moan is in the spotlight again for misleading over millions of pounds of PPE profits, but says she was honest with the government over the contracts. And have beauty pageants gone woke? I'll be joined by a former Miss England after the result of the Miss France pageant sparked fury online. Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with markets commentator at Aquas Exchange, David Buick, and business editor at The Sun, Ashley Armstrong. This is Primetime. Well, to Gaza and our top story tonight. In just an hour, the UN Security Council votes on calls for a ceasefire and a halt to the fighting, with Israel under enormous pressure to scale down its operation. The UK holds one of the casting votes, Rishi Sunak declaring today that the killing, claimed to have reached nearly 20,000 Palestinians, has gone too far. Israel obviously has a right to defend itself against what was an appalling terrorist attack perpetrated by Hamas. But it must do that in accordance with humanitarian law. It's clear that too many civilian lives have been lost and nobody wants to see this conflict go on a day longer than it has to. But the real casting vote is held by the US, which supplies Israel with weaponry and support and is growing increasingly impatient with its ally. Democracies are stronger and more secure when we uphold the law of war. And I've, as I've said, protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral duty and a strategic imperative. Now, those comments made standing next to Israel's Minister of Defense are a visible sign of the Biden administration's irritation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel repeatedly ruling out the only solution, the two-state plan, that the US sees as ending this conflict. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza, meanwhile, says more than 19,500 people have been killed in the fighting so far. International condemnation of civilian deaths is growing. Particular outrage has been sparked by reports that women seeking safety in a Catholic church were shot dead by Israeli troops. Unarmed civilians are being bombed and shot at. And this has even happened inside the Holy Family Parish Complex, where there are no terrorists but families, children and sick people with disabilities, nuns. Some say it's terrorism, it's war. Yes, it is war, it is terrorism. And amid all of this, the fighting's effects ripple far beyond the war zone. Houthi rebels from Yemen attacking passing ships on their way to the Suez Canal. They say they're hitting Israeli-linked vessels, a British one targeted just this morning. Massive companies, including oil giant BP, are now sending their vessels thousands of miles out of the way to avoid the rockets, sparking fears of price rises, including for energy worldwide. Now, for the latest on the ground, let's speak to Talk TV correspondent Tom Much, who's been in Israel throughout this conflict for us. And, and, and Tom, just speak to us a little bit about where we're at in the current state of fighting. I mean, Israel has been clear that they're going to keep going until what they're calling the end. 
Yeah, well, this is one of the problems is that no one is really seeing an end immediately in sight. If you want to look at the purely military situation, it doesn't seem like Israel has even entirely cleared Hamas out of North Gaza yet. In fact, they're getting quite bogged down militarily in the south in cities like Khan Yunus, which is not just full of Hamas fighters, but it's also full of Palestinian civilians. Israel has been trying to make armored raids with the tanks and infantry, and it is getting bogged down. In very, very difficult urban terrain, something that the U.S. and many international experts warned Israel would happen before the ground invasion began in late October. Now there are other problems, as you mentioned before, problems with the Houthi rebels in Yemen bombing ships on the uh, on the Bab el Mandeb Strait. You've also got problems in the north. Hezbollah having stepped up rocket attacks and uh, uh, a great increase in the fire going on there between Hezbollah and IDF troops on the northern Lebanon border. And then you've also got more raids and more fighting going on in places like Janine in the West Bank. Now that's turned into almost a uh, mini urban combat war of itself. So it's really, really, and especially with growing international condemnation of the death toll, it's it's quite a bleak mood in Israel now as far as the war is concerned. A war on so many fronts, as you put it there. And if the viewers are thinking it's hard to keep up, it's the three H's, Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah. This is what Israel claims is the Iran-backed enemy of Israel. Now, Tom, in terms of the hostages over the weekend, that terrible news that three hostages were killed by Israeli forces in what is deemed now to be, have been an accident. We'll talk about that more shortly with our Israeli government spokesperson. But in terms of the other hostages, some might forget there are still hostages in captivity. Do you have any update on them? So actually, over the last couple of days, there have been some significant protests in major cities, especially Tel Aviv and Haifa, for the release of those further hostages. But not just for the release, but also for Israel to slow down the military campaign and try and go back to the negotiating table to get those hostages released. And there is a lot of consternation also about the way in which those hostages were killed. People are asking, well, well, why? They were, they were shouting in Hebrew. They were waving a white flag. You know, they looked like they were, if they were enemy forces, they would have been surrendering. How, would the, how was this able to happen? How are the IDF's rules of engagement not designed, not just to protect Palestinian civilians, but to protect any hostages that they might be coming across? This is causing real, real concern within Israel. And you're starting to hear more voices raised about the conduct of the war within Israel itself, whereas weeks ago it was very, very popular. Tom Much speaking to us from Israel this evening. Thank you. Well, as we said, Israel faces a vote in the UN Security Council to announce calls for a ceasefire, while some key allies are increasing the pressure and demanding fewer civilian casualties in Gaza. Our next guest is Avi Hyman, spokesperson for the Israeli government. We've spoken before, Avi. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, quite simply, to start on the UN Security Council ceasefire vote, what is your hope for what happens? Hi, Rosanna. Thank you so much for having me on again. Um, well, we hope that uh, that countries will vote with uh, their conscience. We hope that countries will understand that calling for a ceasefire at this point is actually calling for the continuation of Hamas rule in Gaza, something that Israel can't accept and something that the free world can't accept, because that would mean more October 7th. That would mean more um, Hamas operatives, terrorists plowing through our borders, uh, beheading children, uh, raping, mutilating bodies, They've said they'll do it again, and we can't allow them to do it. That's why the war from the beginning has two aims, to destroy Hamas and to bring home every last hostage. And that's what we'll continue to do. This war will end when Hamas ends. Now, to, sorry to be blunt on this, but to bring home every last hostage, but three were shot by Israeli forces over the weekend. How do you explain that? That was a gut-wrenching um, incident that happened in Gaza. We know that our soldiers are under immense, immense pressure um, with all kinds of psychological warfare at every, you know, in every alley, in every building. We're hearing reports of, uh, of Hamas playing, uh, playing uh, voices of babies and, and, and toddlers uh, crying out in, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, we've seen all kinds of uh, booby-trapped situations with, uh, with children's toys and again, music and, and, and noise in Hebrew, um, it's still being investigated. But as you see, the difference between Israel and Hamas 
is that every time anything happens in Gaza, um, in the war, Israel will fully investigate. We'll put up our hands when we've done, you know, something that shouldn't have been done, when when mistakes have been made. We will admit it. Um, in the meantime, Hamas can just lie through their teeth, say whatever they want. And unfortunately, people often copy and paste without checking the facts. And in terms of that psychological pressure, you talk about the troops being under. I mean, it, it is just a terrible situation, the ongoing conflict on the ground, what they are dealing with on a daily basis, but also, of course, everyone in Gaza at the same time. That's why these ceasefire votes are happening, because people just want to see a stop to the violence on the ground. Hearing what you say there, of course, about the retribution for what happened on October 7th, but people are saying here, an MP in the UK is saying that bombs don't eradicate ideology. Benjamin Netanyahu says he's fighting this until the end, but what end can there be? So, I mean, there are precedents for this in history. I mean, we saw what Britain, together with their allies, uh, America and the other allies, did to ISIS. ISIS was eradicated. And yes, the, the idea can live on in the same way that there are still people who believe in the, the ideology of Adolf Hitler in Germany. But who would have thought that Britain would be uh, one of the closest allies to Germany, that America would be one of the closest allies to Germany, to Japan? See, what needs to be done the day after Hamas is total demilitarization of Gaza, de-radicalization, and the rebuilding of Gaza, building a better Gaza for the children of Gaza and the children of Israel. There needs to be a situation by which they don't raise their children from age zero to hate and want to kill Jews and eradicate the state of Israel. We can't live with a terrorist state um, on our southern border, nor could England, nor could any country. Harvey Hyman speaking to us this evening from the Israeli government. Thanks. Thank you. Well, my next guest joins me from New York for more on what the US, Israel's chief supporter, is making of its stance. Ian Williams is the president of the US Foreign Press Association. Thank you, sir, for making time. Uh, let's just talk a bit about the US relationship with Israel here. The uh, US says its support is unshakable, but are you seeing that today through what we've seen from, for example, Lloyd Austin's statements? It's getting very shaky because they're asking the Netanyahu to do very reasonable things and he just refuses. And it's very visible to the voters, which is very important this year, that he is basically getting snubbed by Netanyahu. Uh, the whole basis of this, for example, is the two-state solution, which you know many of us have been dubious about, but it's enshrined in the Oslo Peace Accords. It's enshrined. Every Israeli government since then has promised the US that its solution will include the two-state solution. Biden keeps talking about two-state solution. Netanyahu and his cabinet say, nah, not us. And settlements. Biden keeps saying, stop those settlers. Stop the settlers harassing ordinary Palestinians in the West Bank. Does it happen? No, it carries on. He says, be selective with your targeting in Gaza. Does it happen? No, it doesn't. And they can't even select their own hostages. I mean, I did hear that they were said it was an accident. Well, yeah, I'm sure Hamas claims that October the 7th was an accident. Do you buy that? No, this this was part of deliberate policy of impunity, uh, where, you know, the IDF basically doesn't care. If, if, if they'd have been Palestinians, God knows what would have happened. Probably been hit with a mortar bomb. It's just, it's, it really is this culture of impunity, which we're seeing because the spokesman there came out with a whole series of unsupported allegations, but did not respond to the original thought. They said they want precision. 20,000 people dead in Gaza. Despite pleas from Biden, who pays for it, and the rest of the world. So Israel is on its own. If it survives tonight's resolution, it'll be by virtue of a US veto, which devalues the veto. I mean, I don't want to bring in too much extraneous stuff, but many people were surprised that there was, let's say, inadequate support for Ukraine in the United Nations. That was partly because people said, hang on, if one annexation is wrong, one annexation is wrong how come the other one's OK and you're going to cover it with a veto? And, and people do look at these. It's, it's in connection. There are UN resolutions. Israel has been regularly and almost religiously flouting them. Uh, Biden has shown that so far there are absolutely no consequences for denying it. I mean, he's paying for it. 
He's giving diplomatic support. He has an election coming up and he's still going on. And I, I am actually surprised by the degree of popular support for the Palestinians on the streets. There's much less equivocation than I'd have thought yeah. for the demonstration. I hear a lot of what you're saying there. You've made some really interesting and clear points. I would counter that I don't think Hamas would ever declare that October 7th was an accident. They've been very clear that that was deliberate and that they would do it again. They did not if claim. They... They, they did not claim and have not claimed rapes, mutilation, mutilations and the rest of it. That's been added in. Some of it might be proven. A lot of it is hearsay. And the fact that an IDF spokesman says that they heard somebody say that this happened and that happened, it does bear examination. I think we I... sometimes forget our journalistic faculties on this. But yes, Hamas are not nice people. No one's claiming that they are. But anyone who says, are you sure about that, is immediately blown up as a Hamas supporter. And I... on TV show after TV show, people are, it's almost like a loyalty oath. Will you denounce Hamas before you say another word, before you say Happy Christmas or anything? Will you first denounce Hamas? It's almost ludicrous. Ian, I, I, I hear that. I hear your point. I know exactly what you're referring to as well. However, I would still, and, and the point about journalistic examination of the Israeli state and government, and it, uh, in, repeatedly when I've had to interview Israeli government people, but also people from Palestinian authorities as well, you end up with a barrage of whataboutism. They point at the other side and say they're lying. I'm telling the truth, they're lying. It, it is obviously a very tough thing to encounter, but at the same time, I will... Uh, counter that still Hamas claimed responsibility for the terror attack that happened on October 7th. They claimed responsibility for the attack. They didn't claim responsibility for all of the things that they were accused of. On the contrary, I mean, this is a when did you stop beating your wife question. Because if you, if you say yes, then you are carrying on all of the other stuff that was put in there, a small print. I mean, remember the 50 dismembered babies that Biden is still talking about? That was walked back almost immediately. Be, you know, you 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 see you see the first allegation, but you don't get it. As Mark Twain said, a, a lie has gone halfway around the world before the truth has put its boots on. We and we have... deal with that all of the time in the electronic media now, as you know full well. Absolutely, I do. And you know, of course, we do have thorough video footage that has been provided that was from Hamas terrorists on that day that show exactly the atrocity that carried out. It was shown to 100 international journalists who relayed the atrocities. Look, Ian, I could keep talking to you about this and perhaps we'll invite you on again to discuss because it is interesting, but unfortunately we have just run out of time. So thank you very much for joining us, Ian Williams. Sorry, good to talk to you. Well, my next guest will be joining us after the break, talking more about what Israel's chief supporter is making of its stance. And we'll be moving on to other stories as well, talking about what's happening with the latest in Michelle Moan's case. She is in the spotlight once again. The argument between the so-called Baroness Bra. We'll have more on that after the break. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Next tonight, who's right, who's wrong? It is a war of words. Baroness Michelle Moan taking aim at the government, saying Rishi Sunak and others knew about her link to PPE company MedPro when it awarded the firm contracts worth more than £200 million. Now, this comes after Miss Moan and her husband not only admitted they lied over their connection to the firm, but that they made £60 million quid in profit from it. She insists it was not a secret, but is now facing calls to be kicked out of the House of Lords. Meanwhile, Michael Gove is under pressure to face questions from MPs about the whole issue. The Prime Minister himself says he is taking all of this incredibly seriously. Before we get into that, here's a reminder. We will get onto that of how the couple finally held their hands up, but we will get into that. First of all, joining me on the legal side of things and from Westminster, for more, Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald. Thank you, Alicia. I mean, talk us through the latest today because a lot of viewers won't have been the he said, she said detail of this, which is Michelle Moan accusing the government of one thing, then accusing her of another. Yeah, so this all started in her interview where she actually said it was Michael Gove who gave her the green light for this big £200 million PPE MedPro contract. She said that Michael Gove actually should be facing questions about this as he just gave her the go-ahead and said that all was well. She also brought Sir Chris Wormald, he is a really senior civil servant, in the Department of Health into this and said both of them have questions to answer. Most recently, though, she's actually mentioned Rishi Sunak, who said that he's taking this case really seriously. She said, what is he talking about? And I quote, that is her words, not mine. She said that he was aware of this at the time and that he is just trying to cover his tracks. She also said on Twitter that, that he is benefiting from some of the vaccines and that he is getting profits from there as well so that he has no right to point any finger. So it's really become a bit of a he, shed, he said, she said debate in this. And Michelle Moan has really broken her silence online since that interview. Now, one of the things at stake, stake here, rather, is Michelle's moan play, moan's place in the House of Lords, whether she gets to keep her seat or not. I don't even know if it's technically possible to get her to stand down uh, from it. But what's the latest on that? Yes, yeah, so this is really important to remember. Michelle Moan is not a former member of the House of Lords. Lots of people are saying she is. She is not. She is still very much a member of the House of Lords. She's taken what is called absence. It's the same as uh, maternity leave, sickness leave, all of those things. It's where you take a sustained break, but you have the right to return to the House of Lords. That is exactly what she plans to do. So regardless of what happens here, she may well return back to the House of Lords and pay another role in our lawmaking. The, the House of Lords itself don't have the right to strip her of the title, but Parliament and the House of Commons do. They could pass an act in order to get rid of her, but no one knows what's going to happen with that quite yet. Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Well, let's head over to Joshua Rosenberg now for the legalities of all of this. Joshua is a still a legal commentator. First, before we get into the legals, Joshua, I just want to ask what your thoughts were watching the interview. She was asked why she lied to journalists and she said the government knew about it. I don't think that's really an answer, is it? 
Yeah, and she also said that lying to journalists is not a crime, to which most journalists like myself were quite surprised by that response. But I think the point is lying to the public while it's not a crime, it's, it's not something that maybe somebody who's a member of the House of Lords and had connections to government should have done. That's, that's the inference here. Let, let's talk about the legals then in this. Um, the law for the PP Meg Pro is still under investigation by the National Crime Agency. Talk to us about what they're trying to establish. I imagine they are looking at whether there was any fraudulent uh, transactions there. Uh, I mean, uh, Doug Barrowman, uh, Baroness Moan's husband, said it was a commercial deal. He made a 30% profit. It was all agreed with the government. It was all above board. Uh, nothing to see here. Let's move on. So if that's the case, well, then the National Crime Agency uh, won't find anything. Um, if they do, uh, then there may be a prosecution. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But at the moment, it's just a question of the police investigating whether there has been any criminal action. What about the government's role in this? Because they did have a role. They allowed, uh, you know, these massive contracts to go through. They selected them, supposedly reviewed some of them, obviously not the highest quality, as we are now finding out we did at the time. Um, is there any sort of legal recourse for that? Well, obviously, if there was any breach of contract, uh, then the government could get its money back. Uh, there are arguments about what the government actually specified. But if you're asking a broader question, well, that's really a matter for Baroness Hallett, isn't it? She's the uh, member of the House of Lords, as it happens, who is conducting the public inquiry into COVID. She's been looking at the role of the politicians over the past few days. But I think at some point she will go on to deal with what's called procurement, uh, the way in which all this uh, uh, protective equipment was obtained and paid for by the government and to see whether there are any lessons to be learned from that. Now, this is more than anything a point of interest, but still with some legal uh, bearing, I do promise. Uh, when the interview went out on Sunday, it was with Laura Koonsberg, it was on the BBC. Uh, we should credit them for that, of course. Uh, does that end up becoming legal evidence in terms of the way that the couple responded? I suppose it could be. Um, there's certainly no privilege in the sense that uh, if you give evidence in court, uh, uh, you can say what you like. Uh, if she or he, uh, her husband, defamed anybody, well, then they can be held to account for what they said, as I suppose could the BBC. And obviously, it could be quoted in any legal proceeding, civil or criminal, in the future. Yes, they've said this on the record, and you know, subject to any arguments about whether this was edited, anything significant was cut out, uh, which I'm sure uh, the BBC would be careful not to do. Yes, it can be used in evidence in court. Joshua Rosenberg, solicitor and legal commentator. Thank you. Well, next tonight, it has long been known that Britain is getting larger. In fact, we're one of the heaviest nations in Europe, with two thirds of UK adults now overweight. We're in a health crisis and it is costing our health service dearly. New figures show that 3,000 people a day are being admitted to hospital because of obesity. That's double what it was six years ago. And those admitted are getting younger. 20 children a day now admitted for the same reason. Things are at their worst in Luton, where one hospital admission in every 20 is linked to obesity. So what's it costing our NHS? An estimated 98 billion pounds a year. The government is accused of being brainwashed by those lobbying for fast food companies, with Rishi Sunak recently delaying plans to ban unhealthy food adverts on TV until 2025. Joining me to discuss more on this, GP and columnist Dr Martin Skur, also with me, Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Christopher Snowden. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, Dr Martin, I'll start with you first, if you don't mind, at a time when the NHS is creaking, needing more funding, £98 billion a year. That's a large amount of money. What does it mean to health providers? It's terrifying. You know, this is something that didn't need to happen due to the change in our culture over the last two or three decades, maybe. And it keeps GPs very, very busy dealing with a health epidemic, really, which is as frightening as anything we've ever seen. And the, the figures you gave us, massive, 25.9% of adults are obese. So their body mass index is above 30. And the health consequences of that are huge. Coronary heart disease, hypertension, fatty liver disease, diseases we never saw when I was first in practice in the 1980s. It's a very, to, very, very human. I was about to ask you that. In your career, how have things changed? You talk about a change in culture. Have you really noticed that in the terms of the way people people's bodies are now in the UK? 
It's massive. You, you, not even in the in the GP surgery. You only have to walk around the supermarket and see people that are huge. We never used to see that. And it's frightening. I feel so sad for these people. Difficulty walking, you know, knees splayed out, um, uh, difficulty going upstairs, just difficulty managing. You sit on a tube train, the seats are too narrow. Sit on a bus, the seats are too small for the size of the people that we see. And um, we've really only seen that the last 20 or 30 years. Do you know, in the 1990s, we began to see abnormal liver function in people, uh, which we'd never seen before. And ultrasound scanning had come in. And we learned that this was fatty infiltration of the liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's called NAFL, totally new syndrome we'd never seen before. And now it's everywhere. And NAFL can lead to NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis, inflammation in the liver, which is as bad as the cirrhosis you get from drinking alcohol. People die of it. And it's a precancerous condition. So who would have ever thought that being overweight is a cause of cancer. And that's what the NHS is battling with. It's, it's really frightening. And it's a cultural shift. Let's bring uh, in. I'm not sure we can ever put the genie back in the bottle. Let's bring in Christopher then about this cultural shift and putting the genie back in the bottle. When you see these stories in the papers, when you come on TV shows, discuss them with us, uh, do you think it's a worthwhile topic to discuss? Uh, it's worth trying to debunk some of the claims. Yeah, I mean, when I saw the, the Times front page today, um, I knew it was incorrect, the claim that uh, obesity emissions have doubled in the space of six years. How can anyone even believe that? Shouldn't that set alarm bells ringing when you see uh, a, a rise or a fall of that magnitude in any statistic? You've got to think, well, maybe there's something changed in the methodology there. And that's exactly what's happened here. This is all about secondary diagnoses. Secondary diagnoses are essentially optional, to put it in, in, in crude terms. Uh, doctors and nurses don't have to take a record of a secondary diagnosis. It doesn't mean that the person is in hospital because of obesity, it just means that they are obese. It may or may not have some effects on, uh, on their care while they're in hospital. It may or may not be at least a partial explanation for why they're there, but they're not there just, not all these people are there because of obesity. 98 billion pounds spent treating obesity in the NHS, you just said. That, that's the majority of the NHS budget. How can anyone believe that? Of course, it's, that, that's not what it is. Uh, people seem to lose their ability to think critically when they're talking about this issue and claims that politicians would be quite rightly roasted for seem to be able to get through with no questions asked. Why do you think that is? Oh, it's an emotional issue, I suppose. There's lots of people invested in trying to change what other people eat. I think the media is always keen on a, a, at a crisis. The trouble is we're tr treating everything like a crisis, although it might be quite entertaining and it gets you know, viewers of shows like this wound up in one way or another, uh, it ultimately leads to the loss of liberties and people have been manipulated um, through this kind of scaremongering into allowing the government to, uh, to seize control of the food supply and increasingly dictate what we eat. Let's come back just briefly to Dr Martin and ask uh, what you make of that idea that this has been methodologically manipulated. I think it's about the use of words. People are not admitted to hospital because they're overweight. They're admitted because they've got the consequences of type 2 diabetes, which is itself a consequence of being overweight. So type 2 diabetes sounds quite mild. You don't need injections of insulin, do you? It's just a, a matter of diet and the right tablets to lower your blood sugar. But those people get arterial disease because their cholesterol races up. They rot their legs. So people have amputations. You, you lose your eyes. It's the commonest cause of blindness in the Western world, the retinopathy of type 2 diabetes. So it's the escalating consequence of the diabetes that leads to hospital admissions. And there was the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that I mentioned. So you're not in hospital because of obesity. You're in hospital because of the diseases that arise because of the obesity. And I have, I've only mentioned but few, but you've got coronary heart disease, hypertension, and all the other things that are the consequences of being overweight. Um, and so my colleague there speaks well, but it's not you're not in because you're heavy. You're in because of the consequences of being heavy. Dr. Martin Skow and Christopher Snowden, thank you very much. Well, next year on Primetime, what makes a haircut woke? Why has the ensuing argument gripped France? We'll speak to former beauty pageant competitor about that with Miss France next. We're here!
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Now, France is divided over the controversial outcome of the beauty pageant over the weekend. The Miss France accolade went to Yves Gillis, who became the first award holder in 103 years to have short hair. This follows a loosening of the rules, which had previously banned women over 24 who had been married or given birth. Now, the competition is now also open to transgender women for the first time. Supporters say that all these changes are redefining beauty. Traditionalists have slammed the changes as woke. Let's get to the bottom of this, shall we? I'm joined down the line by the former Miss England winner, Rahima Mathamia. Uh, so good to have you on. Um, talk to us a little bit about what it is like to take part in these pageants. But first of all, just what did you think about the winner, Miss France? Oh, gosh, I'll start with the winner. I think she's absolutely stunning. Objectively, anyone that looks at like her can say that she's a beautiful woman. Um, I think this whole controversy about the fact that this is some sort of woke agenda, because she's a woman that has short hair, is completely ridiculous. She is beautiful. She was chosen to win. She's educated. She's eloquent. I'm not quite sure why it is that a woman having short hair is causing such a controversy. Um, as a woman that's been in a pageant before, I won Miss England in 2021 and I represented England at Miss World. There is so much more that comes into being a representative of your nation. And I don't think the style of your hair or the length of your hair can get in the way of that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm frankly quite surprised that anybody should be so shocked at Lady in France with short hair having won this contest. She's absolutely objectively beautiful, like you say. And France is well known for gamine pixie cuts over decades. Um, so I think a lot of this might be confected, but that is because there is a lot of focus on what we call woke nowadays, uh, which seems to be a label that anyone can apply to things that they don't like. They're a bit progressive. Um, in terms of beauty pageants, then, they come in the crosshairs for that a lot because it's all about how beautiful someone is. So how, how do you defend that? Do you think beauty pageants are OK? I think they're OK. I mean, no one is forcing myself specifically. I would consider myself a feminist. Um, I was not forced to enter into a beauty pageant. It was my first pageant I went through. I had an absolutely amazing experience. The women that choose to go onto these platforms are doing so because they have made the decision to do so. Um, and you meet so many women from across the country, if it's in your nation, across the world, if you go to an international level. And it's not just, you know, it is a beauty pageant at the end of the day, but there are so many other skills that you learn whilst you're in the competition. You learn about public speaking. You know, I'm here speaking to you today. I've spoken on a platform on national television in front of thousands and thousands of people. I'm working with different um, ambassadors and political um, individuals. So so it really sets you up for a different path in your career if you choose to do so or in your life and other skills that you can put into that. Um, so again, I know the people that have particular views on that, but I think there's so much more other than the idea of it just being a beauty contest. Let's open up the conversation. Thank you so much for that and bring in our writer and journalist sitting in the studio, Raquel Rosario Sanchez. Thank you for making time to come talk to us. Um, you were hearing there from a, a former winner. Um, does any of that surprise you? What do you make of pageants? I think that she was absolutely right, that the women who go in there, you know, they're ambitious, they are women who are educated, who really are using them as a platform for a career in maybe the media or a career in um, any other sphere of life. I think that we need to question, though, why is it that for women who want to go into all of these other spheres, first, some of them have to go through this spectacle in which they live. Like, now we, we hear about women. Women have their own TV shows. Women uh, are writing articles. They do all these sort of different things that are not just reduced to their beauty. But you do accept that women have a, a beauty which can be celebrated? Everyone has a beauty that can be celebrated. Men, women, um, I think that does. I think that we live in a time right now in which we have seen past that. We already know that, yes, people can be... I think that we're trying to... What beauty pageants are trying to do is modify certain standards to pretend to be inclusive and open. But at the, at the end of the day, it's women who are parading around in front of an audience, not only the public, but also judges who are saying, well, this one is pretty and this one isn't. I think that there's so much more to women, to everyone, than just that. Rahim is still listening in there. Uh, you heard there what Ra um, Raquel Rosario Sanchez was saying to me in the studio. It must be an argument that you hear a fair amount that women shouldn't be parading themselves objectively to be judged by beauty standards. What, what do you say when people say that to you? I mean, I say essentially, you know, if we're going to be very honest, that is really the sort of foundation. But from that, we've moved along with times. Um, we do have many other sort of aspects of competitions nationally and internationally that, again, help with public speaking. It's not an easy feat to get in front of an audience and explain yourself or talk about charity work that you've done. You know, I'm an ambassador for a domestic abuse charity from my own experience. So I use the platform for me to be able to make a change in either my local community or hopefully nationally. Again, with that, you have to be a sporty individual. So it may have started from a place of, you know, the patriarchal idea of wanting to have women parading themselves but thankfully through time we've progressed and we're able to say hey it's a nice aspect to see something that's or women that are aesthetically pleasing but why don't we add on top of that and have women that are multifaceted that are intelligent that can speak well that have a social cause that they want to fight for and so where we are today in terms of the beauty industry and the beauty pageant industry has taken a huge leap and bounds from where it first began Rahima Mathamia, join us down the line, and Raquel Rosario Sanchez in the studio. Thank you both very much. Next here on Primetime, MPs are set for a pretty big pay rise, but do they deserve it? I'll be joined by a Primetime panel next. We're going to go over that knotty question as well as some other headlines from the day. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some other big stories from the day. Joining me in the studio, markets commentator of Aquis Exchange, David Buick, and business editor of The Sun, Ashley Armstrong. Thank you both. And See? returning to a, a topic which I love covering, which is MP salaries. And that sounds a bit dry, but just bear with me. <laughs> MPs are set for a £6,000 pay rise next year, taking their salaries to £92,731. Peers will see their tax-free daily allowance rise from 342 quid to 366 quid. The 7.1% bump next April is far higher than the 5% negotiated for many frontline healthcare workers for this year. So we are asking the question, is this justified? That's just shy of 100 grand for an MP. I still think this country somewhat underpays civil servants. I know that doesn't seem that popular as a, a concept when a lot of them are un seemingly under investigation at the moment. But David, do you think 92 grand is acceptable for an MP? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what we don't have in this country is continuity. Mm. And when you have a volatile situation politically, and if you say to a, somebody, a lady or a bloke saying that you're earning £80,000 working for Vodafone, say hypothetically, give it all up and come be an MP for the same. And he's going to say, seat's a bit marginal, not sure I like that. So what you're not doing is attracting enough quality people. There was a piece that I think Ashley saw in the paper, as I did yesterday, saying that the number of the new Labour MPs that are likely to come in at the next election, one in a hundred works for a FTSE 100 company. That doesn't give us the input that we need mm. when you're running the country. You do not want everybody or all MPs to be, you know, come from the public sector. You want a variety. You want lawyers, you want accountants, you want business people. So I actually don't think, and I know you'll probably get a tirade of abuse from your uh, viewers, 92,000 ain't enough. Mm. 
Please don't abuse David Buick <laughs> if you're watching this, or at least put it in a nice card or something, address it to Talk TV, and we'll pass it on to him. Uh, look, in terms of not paying them enough, Ashley, I think my point is also that it will maybe crack down on the second job issue and lobbying, yeah. which think, is an yeah. issue. Yeah, I think that's it. I think the thing that probably will stick in people's throats is exactly the point that you said yeah. about the, the difference between what nurses and things like that and the pay rise. But I agree with David, there's been a huge lack of what you could call quality politicians. Um, and the idea that actually they're having to almost bump up their salaries by taking these second jobs almost. And, and therefore, it's not even that, it's not being completely entirely focused on the work that they should be doing, which should be one of the top jobs in the country. Absolutely. It shouldn't have, it, there couldn't be anything more responsible that you should be doing as a politician. But in fact, actually, you see the amount of abuse that they get, mm. the amount of um, the, the big job that they have to constantly do. I mean, most of them don't seem to be in the seat for longer than six months before being shuffled onto another post as well. So you kind of think, what is the attractiveness other than ego mm. of being a politician these days? And actually, I think that that idea of having a salary that allows you to afford a life that largely demands that you're spending most of your time in London and Westminster, I mean, it, it's very hard when you look at kind of what £95,000 is versus the average salary. Oh, but very much so, You yeah. kind of have to think these are the big jobs and if you can have a big job in just a normal corporate, mm. that pays twice as much, you could say, we very easily. We need quality people. We should have quality jobs. people. It's about it. attracting the right people yeah. and keeping them focused on yeah. the job. Shouldn't be that hard, you'd think. You know, who doesn't need a few extra bob? Elon Musk. But he's in hot water yet again, this time with the European Union, his uh, increasing foes these days. Its digital commissioner announcing the opening of formal infringement proceedings against X, formerly Twitter, accusing it of breaching rules in areas including countering illegal content and disinformation. Now, X says it is cooperating with the regulatory process. Is this just another small legal hurdle for him to jump or is it another nail in the coffin of X, David? What do you reckon? Well, this is... Probably going to be a saga that goes on longer than Peyton Place did 50 years ago, I think. I mean, this is nothing new. Um, and I feel extremely sorry for Miss Yaccarino, who is obviously the chief executive of X or Twitter, if you prefer. Because when you've got somebody who's as powerful and as open mouthed as Elon Musk is, you're not going to be able to decide your own destiny. Yeah. And clearly, there have been some bad situations here, no question. Mm -hmm. And, but when you also think that we amused and amused ourselves, Ashley and I, when we worked out that having paid $46 billion for X or Twitter, whatever you want, I doubt it's worth $10 billion now. But you mm. know what? I'm not going to get my handkerchief out and dab my eyes. Mm. Because Tesla is up 134%. Mm. Mr Musk has got a huge chunk of that. The company's valued at $794 billion, so let's not lose too much sleep. We won't no. be losing sleep over it, will no. we, Ashley? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think this idea about disinformation and what Musk always kind of goes on the offence about is if you look at what's going on at the rival platforms, for example, TikTok and, mm. um, and Snapchat and all the rest of it, the amount of disinformation and fake videos that are appearing, because this is all bubbled into a crescendo because of what's happening with Hamas and those types of videos. I think, actually, Musk has some points, but... It's odd if you've got kind of a social media platform and he's trying to style himself as the truth sayer and trying to do that on behalf of the world. It's mm. quite a tricky thing for a, for a billionaire to do. put it very diplomatically. <laughs> so. He waded into something that I'm not sure he realised the enormity of. Yeah, no. Sort of saying, I'm going to allow free speech. And yeah. what happens, um, it's been an extraordinary... It's a nice ride. trinket for free speech. It's a full-time job. It is a full-time job. Of course yeah. it is. Uh, look, here is a question um, about who has the key to succeeding in finance that might put the hairs on the back, up on the back of the neck of some people watching the show and even potentially some gentlemen in the studio. Yeah. According to a new study of 150,000 people across the finance sector, if you are a white man from a higher socioeconomic background, you are 30 times more likely to succeed than an ethnic minority woman from a working class background. Let's talk about levelling the playing field in the finance sector. I think the words, David, sort of white man, when they're in headlines now, it kind of... I think people get defensive, understandably, white men generally. Uh, the study is a study. Um, I mean, it, but nothing new here in terms of surprises from the square mile. When I started in the city 61 years ago, ladies got half the salary that gentlemen did for doing the same job, even at clerical level. And there was no one from the ethnic minority at all, unless you work for Habib Bank or something like that. It just wasn't... We've come a hell of a long way. And I am very keen that diversity should be pursued, that you get the balances right. 
and that you get the contribution from all kinds of areas. But as regards the finance sector, I don't know who did these figures, well, we do because we were told, but if you went into, say, Merrill Lynch's dealing room, mm. there wouldn't be a white middle-class person there because the Chinese and the Indians are the best mathematicians in the world. And also, when it comes to algorithms and things, they stand alone. If you go into the Metro Bank, there is hardly a, a white middle-class person there. I think it's very easy to be specific about this. I think that diversity is really gathering momentum. I find this, these figures, I'm not saying they're untrue because obviously they've gone into an awful lot of trouble to mm. get them, but I think there is a lot more diversity in the finance world. And also, we don't actually know whether people don't want to come from the ethnic minorities mm. to work in the world of finance. So I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. I think serious progress has been made. And I've been in the industry now for many years and there is an awful lot of people from all kinds of backgrounds and so they should mm. be making their contribution. Ashley, mm. uh, in uh, perhaps ironic fashion, we're very short on time. Yes. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> Briefly, what do you think? Well, I think that, yes, we've made progress, but I think in finance, yes, it should be reflecting more of society than it ever has. And I think, you know, there's a long way to go. If we were even to mm. look at the FTSE 100, there's still only eight female bosses. Coming over to somebody who loves to be described as a white man. I know he does. Piers Morgan, <laughs> what's coming up on the show? <laughs> um, the, I, I am. I'm, there's nothing wrong with it. We are allowed to be white. It's not actually illegal at the moment. Well, just wait. Yeah, give us give us, give us, us a few years, Piers. <laughs> <laughs> what how's, coming uh, up on the how's show? How's your hangover? Uh, yeah, it took a few days. Mm. You're a generous host. Thanks Thank for you. the party. Quite overwhelming to see that many famous people in the same room. <laughs> Extraordinary scenes. It was like Madame Tussauds if they all started drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's all we've got time for. You have to watch Piers' show to see what's coming up. Prime time, that's all we've got time for tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks to our panellists in the studio. Good night. It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans are...